Well, they love to protest over there, huh? Thousands of folks in the UK on the streets of London voicing their protest for our president, our president, calling him a racist and even flying a balloon depicting Donald Trump as a baby. But my next guest says this, this actually isn't the first time a US president was met with such disrespect. That's exactly what it is, disrespect in a foreign country. Presidential historian Doug Weed joins me right now with more. Doug, I always love talking to you. You know, I was a, I was a history student, and I still appreciate that historical perspective, and I think it's very important for us to keep this in mind. So walk us all through how and when this has happened before. <laughs> many, many times, but one of the most striking is Ronald Reagan in 1983. Somehow I More knew you were going to say that. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> More than a million people poured into the streets of Europe. There were protests in Stockholm and Vienna and London and Paris, and there were 400,000 people on the streets in Bonn, Germany, 200,000 on the streets in Stuttgart. Uh, there was a bomb thrown into one of the American bases. So I took a trip around the world, a speaking tour in the 80s. And when I came home, I told my family, America is hated in every nation on earth except South Korea and the apartheid government of South Africa. <laughs> it was terrible. I mean, you think of what terrible. that president accomplished, right? You think of Ronald Reagan and, you know, Mr. Gorbachev, take down this wall. I mean, he really transitioned the world in pretty wonderful, incredible ways and yet was met with such resistance. Do you see any similarities, sir? Yeah, I, you know, you make a very good point because he was trying to introduce Pershing II missiles into Europe and that's what spurred the hatred and the anger. But because he introduced Pershing II missiles into Europe, the Cold War ended and Germany was reunited after 40 years of being divided. So, so he you think was of those people in Stuttgart, not to interrupt you, but you remember them, <laughs> they were in the, you know, 200,000, I think you said in Stuttgart that were out yeah. there protesting. And yet, think of um, what what he was able to accomplish not just for us not just for the world but also for Germany and that reunification that happened Yes, he, he had to be tough. It, and in that sense, Trump reminds me of Reagan. Both of them eat nails in their cereal for breakfast. <laughs> I, I thought this Rosenstein press conference was a hoot. I thought, you know, the Justice Department, they're like the judicial branch, the legislative branch, the executive branch. They're a separate branch of government. They don't answer to any oversight. Now they've got their own foreign policy. <laughs> so a few days before his meeting with Putin, uh, yeah. they're going to preempt you, you think it with their deliberate? announcement. Oh, yeah. yes, I mm -hmm. certainly do. And I think that's, and that would undermine anybody other than someone like a Ronald Reagan or a Donald Trump, because he, he goes into that meeting with Putin thinking, hey, you can't keep, you can't control your own government. How are you going to tell me what to do? Mm -hmm. But th th we've seen this before. And he, I'd like to read you just a short line of a great memo to the ambassador uh, in the, of the, the American American ambassador to the UK, and it says He's this, there. as to the politics of Washington, the most striking thing is the absence of personal loyalty to the president. He has no admirers here. And that was written about Abraham Lincoln. So yes, good presidents, tough presidents, they're going to be criticized too. Yeah, you know, it's, it's remarkable. Um, it, I guess, you know, history ultimately is the judge. Um, but when you're, you're living it every day, it takes a certain kind of personality, right, to be able to see through all the clutter and see through all the noise. And this president is managing to do so, but we also know that he's sensitive to it. He doesn't like the media calling him out on a whole <laughs> bunch of stuff. He doesn't like it. What are the differences between, say, how he reacts personally to the media and how Ronald Reagan did. 
Well, he lets off steam. I noticed that about Trump. He talks about it. That, <laughs> that must be a great release for him because Reagan had to keep quiet and there was no Twitter. So Reagan had to speak in subtle tones. And I tell you, Trish, there was no Fox. It was very frustrating. Reagan would give a speech or a press conference and it would be bracketed by commentary on the left before and after. They'd say, mm -hmm. now let us tell you what Reagan really meant. And then they'd paraphrase it and tear it apart. It was tough. So they were the different American times. But the American people, they, they saw it differently, though, Doug. I mean, uh, it, you know, and you, you're right, there, was, there, was, there were no other outlets out there, right? So it was controlled by mainstream media. Everybody had a leftist view, and they promoted that view. Um, and yet somehow Americans, Doug, they still saw through it because he got elected <laughs> twice. I don't know how they do, but somehow they can smell when it's off and when it's not right. And somehow uh, the, the democracy survives and triumphs. We, we don't do what we're told sometimes by the all-powerful, all-wise media and the elitists who try to run this country. Sometimes we get our own stubborn opinions. It must be really frustrating being elitist <laughs> right now. <laughs> oh, I, there's thousands of them right now in London, right? <laughs> Taken to the streets. And, and it, we certainly know back here at home um, how hard it is for some members of the elite, and I say that on both sides. I mean, it's it's not as though it's just the left. There are, you know, the, the never Trumpers on the right as well, and this has been a challenging time for them. But, you know, when you go in and you shake things up, sometimes change is very hard, and sometimes, you know, what do they say in Washington? If you want a friend, get a dog. I mean, it's <laughs> it's uh, it's just unusually, I imagine, unusually uncomfortable for I this just... particular president. <laughs> I think so, but I appreciate him and his family for the sacrifices they're making. It's astounding to me. It's astounding. Doug, thank you so much. Always good to <laughs> see you. Thank you, Trish.